So, um, good morning, everybody. Thank you, Serge. Thank you to, to Chris. Thank you to everybody for this uh, really um, exciting symposium. So, I'm um, a, a basic scientist, and um, tomorrow I'm going to Japan to the World Pain Congress. And many of you might have seen that film with Bill Murray and Scarlett Johansson, Lost in Translation. Well, what I'm going to try and do is translate from the basic science through to the patients in terms of um, hyperalgesic mechanisms. So I, I think you all, all know this, that we know that um, what's been called nociceptive pain is basically an inflammatory or non-inflammatory response with the primary um, driving event being damage to tissue and chemical activation of pain endings in that area. And it contrasts to neuropathic pain where tissue is normal, but there's a dysfunction or a lesion or a disease of peripheral nerves, and so it becomes uh, ion channel changes. And then in the middle, things like low back pain and cancer pain can be combinations um, of the two. So osteoarthritis is a sort of classical nociceptive pain, but what I'm going to try and do as we go along is to give you some evidence that there could be, in certain patients, some um, neuropathic components, particularly in severe osteoarthritis and the consequences for treatment, and then to go on and, and consider the changes that are induced both peripherally and centrally that generate the hyperalgesia um, in these patients. So on the um, bottom left, we have the peripheral events, and in common with any input that is maintained from peripheral nociceptors, activity in those peripheral fibers arrives within the spinal cord and will generate a hypersensitivity. We then have two parallel pathways that ascend to the brain. One of them is the sort of classical sensory pathway through the thalamus and the cortex, which allows us to locate our pain. It's, it's in my left knee, for example and to describe its intensity. But equally, we have the ancient limbic brain, and there, a pain-driven pathway will interact with limbic function, which are basically emotional events. And in, in the light of the previous talk, the sleep-wake cycle is, is controlled um, within those areas. And then the, the cortex and these limbic areas are able to talk back to the spinal cord through descending pathways, which can be stop signals, red for stop, or green for go. And so changes out in the periphery have the potential to alter signaling at the site of injury in the spinal cord and in many parts of the brain. And so key events are the peripheral channels and sensors, peripheral sensitization out in that damaged joint. In the spinal cord, we have wind-up, central sensitization, this amplification of these incoming signals, and the descending controls, which are able to interact with the spinal cord. And in the brain, we know that comorbidities, such as anxiety, are important risk factors for chronicity of um, these pains. And the link there, I think, is that anxiety is a limbic brain function and could be altering those descending pathways. So when we have an acute painful stimulus, and I'll try and kind of move from side to side to be fair to everybody, we have activation by various modalities of our pain sensors. In inflammatory pain, inflammatory cells um, release many chemicals, as you know, tissue damage likewise. So we have a very clear peripheral sensitization, but that in turn will drive a central sensitization. And in neuropathy, the tissue is normal, the problem's in the nerve um, there as well. So just to kind of go back to principles, so-called primary hyperalgesia is to, and you can look at quantitative sensory testing, you can look at those um, uh, uh, profiles of, of volunteers, is in the site of the damage. You can mimic it with capsaicin, you can mimic it with ultraviolet radiation, but basically it's a peripheral sensitization to mechanical and thermal stimuli. But if that zone of pain increases around that initial area, and there's a particularly a mechanical hypersensitivity, this is due to central mechanisms and can only really be explained by central sensitization. So 
where we start, and again, I'm going to kind of race through some aspects and, and cover sort of more, more recent ones. We have the chemicals that are present in damaged tissue, the sort of classical prostaglandins, for example. Damaged tissue is acidic, and so we have a large number of hydrogen ions and acid-sensing ion channels, which could be very important. And we have a very interesting chemical, ATP, which is present in every cell in the body. It's required for metabolic purposes. So any cell, if it's a cartilage, a synovium, a, a joint, whatever, that's damaged will be releasing ATP, and it generates pain as well. So these chemicals initially released in a, a damaged uh, joint will sensitize at low levels and at high levels produce activation and a drive entering the spinal cord. And so we have the, the basis for the non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs. But we start to have new targets um, out in the periphery. One of them, which is kind of interesting, is um, CGRP here, which is probably released by local reflexes in the pain fibers. And antibody therapies to CGRP are being pursued for, for migraine and headache. And they could be very interesting, although whether an antibody will access a joint is an interesting question. And then with um, ATP here, there are both peripheral roles of this um, mediator, as you see, from broken cells, but from neurons centrally as well. And there might be interesting uh, new targets there. But we kind of heard a little bit yesterday um, from Professor Walsh about track A and nerve growth factors. And one really important point that Pat Mantire has made um, many, many times, that if you go and look at a bone, if you go and look at a joint and compare it to the skin, some of these growth factor receptors are remarkably different. They're hugely increased in the sensory afferents from bone compared to skin. And it's interesting as well that those ATP, the P2X3 receptor in particular, there's evidence that they might be very effective against the secondary hyperalgesia from the skin, much less so about the bone pain. But this nerve growth factor, NGF, is a, is a key player. And again, you've heard about the therapies based around these humanized monoclonal antibodies to um, NGF and how there's an excess of this growth factor in states of inflammation, acute and chronic roles um, of this, but the problem, and maybe an interaction with non-steroidal drugs, that there was premature joint replacement in these patients. But this is such a huge molecule that the actions must be peripheral. And again, I think it reiterates how important the periphery is. And the kind of, probably the best example of all is the large number of patients, when you replace that damaged joint, they have pain uh, relief but not all, and we'll, we'll come back to that. Now, we think about these chemical mediators, but I think we must remember that in order for those chemical mediators to actually generate pain, they need to produce action potentials in those nerves, and sodium channels are critical for action potentials. We have a whole repertoire of sodium channels, and the two shown here, 1.7, and 1.8 have been shown to have preferential roles in pain. They are somewhat localized in pain fibers and not in the heart, not in the autonomic nervous system. And 1.7, we have human inherited pain disorders based around dysfunction of this channel. So it's critically important in humans. And we have a, um, a series of preclinical studies showing great effectiveness of these selective sodium channel blockers in a model of osteoarthritis, um, including drugs that can only work in the periphery. And very often, these drugs fail to have much effect in the control situation, but produce dramatic effects in the osteoarthritic model. And these drugs, I think, could be very interesting by preventing all those chemical mediators by acting on the action potentials that are moving centrally. So if we don't stop the periphery, we will generate activation of C-fibers and sensitization of deep spinal cord neurons so that a repeated stimulus is now producing an enhanced response. The central sensitization is nothing to do with neuropathy. 
It's seen in osteoarthritis. It's seen acutely in healthy humans who've just received capsaicin that activates the TRPV1 receptor. But it's there in neuropathy as well. So this is a common central mechanism. And in states of tissue damage, the peripheral sensitization will favor peripheral activity. So that will be a greater increase in incoming messages and a greater possibility for central sensitization. And basically what happens is that thresholds of these neurons decrease, their receptive fields expand, and so any spread of pain away from the local dermatomes, the local segmental areas, is going to be this. If it goes too far and it becomes whole body, it is not spinal sensitization at all. The spinal cord is not attached to every segment. We'll come back to that. And there can be ongoing activity as well. So you can wind anybody up by making the same facetious comment on uh, many occasions. Well, this is what the neurons do as well. And so the neurons now move from a state of normal responsivity to hypersensitivity. And now, and it's driven by C and A delta fibers, but once this is established, any other input, tactile, mechanical, it can be brush, it can be cooling, now are able to access these pain pathways. And the expanded receptive field comes from the fact that inputs which were too weak to previously activate the neurons now can do so. It's the NMDA receptor for glutamate that drives this. And the, all the evidence tells us that the normal inputs from small A delta and C fibers that are transmitted as painful messages, if they arrive on a sensitized neuron, will now generate much greater activity going up to the brain. And we see this in, as I said, many, many pain conditions. So this is not unique. It seems to be a common um, event. And very interestingly, although most of these um, events are due to peripheral drives, there are things like um, fibromyalgia in particular, where the periphery might be normal, but sensitization can be established. But just to <coughs> show you the impact of that, if you look at the neurons in the spinal cord, if you just take this, for example, red is what the periphery is telling the spinal cord, blue is the message going to the brain that central sensitization has produced. So yes, the area of pain gets larger, but secondly, the pain score, the neuronal pain score here, should have been two, wind up, central sensitization has pushed it up to eight. And so you may have a low level of peripheral damage, a low level of peripheral activity, an extremely high pain score, and it's due to this. And very interestingly, after total knee replacement, there are patients who have a persistent post-surgical pain, and if you have abnormal wind-up at the time of surgery, you are more likely to have a persistent post-surgical pain. And Lars Arendt Nielsen, who is speaking here, has shown very beautifully in patients this normal wind-up is enhanced in patients with osteoarthritis, and you can see the spread of pain away from the knee down into um, the feet. And so classical sensitization through the spinal cord. But there are, uh, uh, and one of the reasons for this is that many neurons in the spinal cord may have joint inputs, but also cutaneous and muscular inputs as well. So if these neurons become sensitized as a consequence of joint afferents, the responses to other modalities of stimuli and maybe more distant ones become enhanced as well. But one of the things we don't really fully understand is the contribution of pathways from, from deep tissue. And this is just one example in this case now looking at muscle, but muscle and joints are remarkably similar. And in black, you can see the normal coding of spinal cord neurons that preferentially respond to muscle input. These in normal conditions have no cutaneous input. But if you sensitize the muscle, you produce a peripheral sensitization. They gain a cutaneous input, allodynia, and they have hyperalgesia um, responses to the muscle tissue. 
And so when you sensitize, it's not just the primary area that becomes more responsive, there's a spread. So these messages go up to the brain, and I kind of mentioned um, thalamus and cortex. I haven't got time to, to talk about that, but we can see consequences of central spinal sensitization in the brain. But pain inputs arrive in the limbic brain, and these areas are probably um, critical for the comorbidities that many patients have, because the limbic brain and the amygdala in particular is kind of looking at the outside world. It's linking external events and internal events. It regulates the sleep-wake cycle. So painful inputs into these sorts of areas, and we know the amygdala is radically changed by peripheral inflammation, is likely to be the first step in those changes. But then we have the central gray and some brainstem areas projecting back to the spinal cord. We have on and off cells, which allow these descending pathways to switch pain on and to switch it off. And these are the monoamine systems, noradrenaline, predominantly inhibitory. 5-HT can be inhibitory, but probably excitatory much of the time. So these were basically limbic brain areas from preclinical data, but the limbic brain is the oldest part of the brain. So when we go and image the human brain, we see absolutely identical um, anatomies going on here. So that these descending pathways anatomically are the same, apparently, in all mammals. So we have an inhibition, we have an excitation. This work by um, Irene Trace's group looks at patients with osteoarthritis, looks at the central gray, which is a key area in driving the brain stem and the descending pathways, and there was more activation of this area in patients. It related to their, their pain scores, so this has to be evidence for a descending excitation in patients with osteoarthritis. So, what about descending inhibition? So, without putting somebody in a scanner, you can actually gauge descending inhibition in humans. One pain inhibits another. So this is a sort of classical French painting from a chateau on the Loire Valley. One sister is meant to be expecting a child, so the other one is maybe applying a painful stimulus to help with the pain from childbirth. And this is a more recent East End of London version. But basically, 96% of normal humans, one pain inhibits another. And I kind of brought my daughters up when they were young using this strategy to avoid bothering the health service. They'd fall over, they'd hurt their knee, I'd say, bite your thumb, and then going, Dad, it's brilliant, the pain's gone. So 30% inhibition, one pain by another. But when you go into chronic pain states, including osteoarthritis, one pain inhibiting another fails. So this is a loss of inhibition. Preclinically, we now know that this descending inhibition, whereby a pain somewhere in the body is able to inhibit another, and classically, it's foot against arm, is a noradrenergic alpha-2 adrenal receptor pathway, because the normal inhibition of one pain by another is blocked if you block this system. And interestingly, after nerve injury, what you see is a loss of this inhibition, and you can restore it as well. So we've been looking in osteoarthritis. And in the early inflammatory stages of a model of osteoarthritis, one pain inhibits another beautifully. But as you go into the late phase, this descending inhibition is lost. And so <clears throat> there's lots of evidence that in early inflammatory conditions, descending inhibitions are fine and may in fact increase. But here in the persistent osteoarthritis, those descending inhibitions have been lost. Now, <clears throat> in patients with nerve injury, loss of that descending inhibition, which are, are these individuals here, you should be below the baseline. These patients have descending inhibition, these don't. Duloxetine works in these patients. And tapentadol, this drug that works through noradrenaline reuptake and opioid actions, restores the normal descending inhibition. But the really important issue here 
is that there are positive trials of both of these drugs in osteoarthritis. So we don't know whether they're having the same mechanism, but enhancing noradrenaline availability in the central nervous system restores this descending inhibitory pathway. So in the last couple of minutes, I just want to address the issues of what is happening in these late stages. Because with that descending um, inhibition here, it's normal in the early stages, it's lost here. So <clears throat> a few years back, one of my students looked in the nerves that innervate the knee and saw markers of neuronal death in the high-dose severe models. So one question would be, is this got any relevance to patients? Do any patients have neuropathy? Well, we can't look at these markers. But if you have a neuropathy and you have a knee or a hip replacement, that replacement will restore the damaged tissue, but it will do nothing to your damaged nerves. So one possibility is that these patients are the ones that don't benefit. So Pat Mantire, who's been a fantastic pioneer in this stage, has just looked at natural osteoarthritis, elderly mice, and in these animals, there is a hyper innovation of bone, which is due to an excess of nerve growth factor. Bone erosion and bone against knee could be neuropathic because it's non-inflammatory. But when you start to see this late-stage osteoarthritis, what you see are neuromas being formed, that the overexpression of the nerve fibers is not normal. So when you start looking now at the clinical literature, the translation for this, a series of studies here with about 15 13%, sometimes higher, using questionnaires suggesting that the patients are using descriptors that are the same as those that patients with nerve injury. Not all, but the percentages are actually quite similar to those who, the proportion of patients who don't gain from having um, a new uh, knee. <clears throat> and this is a, another interesting study as well, because they found that, as you can see here, meniscal tears were associated with high ratings of neuropathic descriptors, bone marrow lesions, synovomarial thickness um, as well. So an accumulating human evidence that some patients with osteoarthritis are using descriptors that appear to suggest there might be a neuropathy. So under the kind of normal situation then, with the, um, let's say, the, the acute, the, the, the milder osteoarthritis, we have central sensitization, we have increased uh, central gray activation, descending excitations, et cetera, et cetera. But on the other side is that it's possible that there are some signs there might be neuropathies going on as well or in place of the inflammation. And we need to know whether this is important. So one study looking at prevalence of post-surgical post pain after um, knee replacement, the suggestions that in situations where there might be an underlying neuropathy and you go on and you get the patients who have had a replacement of their, their joint, but no real pain um, uh, 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 um, alleviation, that maybe there's a neuropathy going on. And again, six months later, that's still there because we're not doing that. We're not replacing it. So one other just a little point while finished, and I realize sort of time is short. Preclinically, when you look at the model where there are no neuropathic components, the milder classical inflammatory pregabalin and gabapentin do nothing. If you look in the severe model where there is this indicators of potential neuropathy, and I'm only saying potential neuropathy, there's no direct measures as yet, pregabalin and gabapentin can be effective. So they might be worth considering in certain patients. So what we have then, I would say, is that the hyperalgesia is a combination of events, and we possibly need to subgroup and stratify patients based on their pain, sensory signs and symptoms. But generally speaking, we have the peripheral drive, the inflammatory drives, there might be neuropathic components, central sensitization, 
the pain area increases, high levels of pain um, by the, the sensory pathways, comorbidities, and then loss of inhibition, allowing the GO signal to, to dominate, and so further enhancement of central sensitization. So a number of places, a number of targets um, we can consider. So I'm going to kind of finish there. I'd like to thank my, my lab for um, their work on this, and particularly Stevie uh, Lockwood um, and Carlotta Montagut here have done a lot of the work on osteoarthritis. But thanks to them for allowing me to have a day off in this lovely place, and thank you for coming along. Thank you. Thank you.